Welcome to Harbinger and Work Tech Advisory's exclusive webinar for the C-Suite, the Tech CXO Roundtable. Select the right speaker for audio output. Test your speaker from audio settings. If necessary, join the webinar using your phone. Use the queue and a panel to share your questions. This webinar is being recorded. Attendees will receive the recording. Let's begin. Hello and welcome to all the attendees, hosts and panelists. My name is Shrikant Padatto. I'll be the MC for today's uh, panel discussion. We have a very interesting topic on strategic alignment today, uh, specifically on how technology leaders convey value to internal stakeholders. Being a CTO myself, I run into many occasions where I find it hard to convince my other stakeholders of why we need to make some technology investments. Uh, today's webinar uh, brought to you by WorkTech Advisory and Harbinger Group will throw light on how uh, we can come up with some solutions and, and tips basically to help CTOs uh, address uh, this particular dilemma or problem that we face. So without ado, let me just start uh, by welcoming our hosts, Dr. Vikas Joshi and Madeleine Pearson Hendricks. Vikas is the founder and the CEO of Harbinger Group. He drives Harbinger's vision with a relentless focus on innovation. His doctoral research at the University of Pennsylvania was on entrepreneurial learning. He is also an alum of the Harvard Business School. Welcome, Vikas, and look forward to you introducing this topic to us. Thank you. Madeline is a co-founder and managing director at WorkTech Advisory. We also call Madeline MPH. Uh, welcome, Madeline. Her experience lies at the intersection of HR technology, business transformation, and global go-to-market strategy. She holds an MBA degree from the Eisenberg School of Management. Madeline, look forward to you asking our panel some insightful questions and I look forward to having a great session here. Vikas, uh, may I request you to please get us started? Thanks. Sure. Uh, thank you, Shrikant, for that introduction. And uh, hello, Marilyn. This is going to be fun, isn't it? Yes, it is. And what a wonderful panel we have today, AP and Larry. Um, we're going to introduce them to you in just a bit, uh, but I thought I would set the context for this discussion in just a few quick minutes. Um, so let's get right after it. Uh, this is our game plan for today. Uh, three things, basically. First, the motivation. Uh, why even bother? Why should tech leaders communicate strategically with other shareholders? We're going to talk a little bit about that and then move on to the how question. How do you articulate the impact of technology and business strategy? How do you communicate your technology vision in a manner that it is relevant to the strategy of the business? And finally, we're going to spend some time figuring out the value of using strategic frameworks in aligning everybody. Uh, at the end of the day, all top leaders need to speak the same language, and that's what we will focus on. So this is going to be an exciting hour. Our panel members have tons of stories to share with you. And of course, we're going to keep a lot of time toward the end for your questions, um, which you can start putting in chat. Uh, in any case, we are monitoring the chat. So this is going to be fun, OK? Uh, let's get started uh, with the first question. And here's a startling statistic. According to Gartner's research, and the footnote shows where to find it, 63% of technology leaders find it challenging to articulate the business value of IT within organizations. 
So if you are a CIO, this is a typical dilemma you have. Same with CTOs. And what are the consequences of that? The first consequence is that you need to get budget for your projects. And if you're not able to communicate value, you're not gonna be able to get the budget or not as much as you would like for your projects. So clearly that's a big uh, <clears throat> consequence of not articulating the business value. Secondly, it's a question of priorities on the roadmap because there's many stakeholders who are gonna push and pull at the roadmap items in different ways. And if you believe certain foundational items need to be in place, then you need to be able to say why. If you're not able to do this, then you have other issues. For example, you may not be able to argue for you know, reducing debt and that would affect performance of the software. So that's just an example. Or there could be migration of data or content from one platform to the other. And if you cannot fully describe what needs to be budgeted for it again, you would end up in higher variable costs later. The ultimate cost of this personally for you is personal success is delayed because you need to be able to sit there at the table with the top leadership and make sure they understand the technology vision and your point of view. So with that, we move on to our next point which is an example. Suppose a CTO is trying to articulate Gen AI um, <clears throat> from a strategic perspective. Let's say the CTO has come up with 15 different use cases that sound very compelling. And he or she has listed them in order, use case one, two, three, four, five, one below the other, okay? Now, you think use case one is important, but is it important to everybody at the table? To answer that question, you need to say, what's the strategic priority one, two, three, four, five, and how many strategic priorities does my use case hit? And whether it hits the high priority items. Just to give you an example, think about a digital publisher, next slide please, where the four strategic priorities are expand market, improve production efficiency, integrate a new acquisition, and minimize professional services spend. Let's just say those are the four strategic priorities. In this hypothetical example, if the CTO is excited about some new gen AI way of spotting and minimizing errors, it only hits two strategic priorities, whereas translating content automatically could hit all four priorities, including the topmost priority. So when this just simple example will tell you how to translate your ideas in a way that the organization can rally behind it. Moving on and getting just a little further into strategic communication, there's always this tussle between what's my company's identity? Are we a low cost player? or are we a highly differentiated player? And the CTO is right in the middle of this. Every company is represented by a dot on this graph and they combine cost position and differentiation in some, some combination. Now, if you have a bunch of feature ideas that move this dot toward the point A, which is really a highly differentiated company, right? with a high relative cost position. And if the entire management of the company is, 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 is moving toward a low cost position, right? So the whole of the management is thinking of uh, becoming something like Costco or Walmart, and, and you are on your own figuring out how to make a sophisticated product that would uh, you know, make you the Nordstrom of your industry. That's not gonna work. So it's important to see where you fit on the cost versus differentiation curve and whether everyone agrees which way the organization is moving. And sometimes it may just move toward the frontier, which means you do not change the position, just get better at what you're doing. So that too is important. Here's another more nuanced example. 
suppose, and it's, it's a busy figure, but for a minute, all of you have understood what a product market fit is, right? I mean, the market has some pain points that people are willing to pay something for your product. And then you have a product that does exactly what the market wants. So you have product market fit. There's also a product channel fit because to reach the market, you need to use a channel. And there's the market model fit because you can have a high cost, low volume model or a low cost, high volume model. And then the channel will change based on the model you use. If you have a low cost model, you would use low touch marketing channels. If you had a high cost model, you would use high touch sales channels. If you change any one of these four blocks, everything else changes. For example, if the CEO comes along and says that the board has decided that we are going to move up market from mid market, we are going to go to higher part of the market. Immediately that changes the market that disturbs the product market fit. The product needs to have different features. Now, at the same time to reach that market, you need a different channel. And so the channel demands certain features. You need to be able to see what's the connection between any of these shifts and the product. And it becomes a lot easier to communicate your point of view, as well as understand other stakeholders' point of view, because at the end of the day, it's a two-way communication. So I could go on and on. There's the uh, there's many different strategic frameworks. For example, the business model canvas is another. The five competitive forces in an industry is yet another. And then, of course, the balance scorecard is yet another. I will not belabor all that, but I just wanted to lay this out as the vocabulary of conversation between chief technology officers who are passionate about their technology vision and the chief product officer, the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, and the chief sales officer. So with that, I think I'll hand it back to you, Madeline, to bring our panel in and then have them guide us through the rest of the uh, CX or round table. Thank you. Thank you, Vikas. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to introduce our panelists today. And our expectation is that we are going to have a, um, a deep walk in the woods on some really important topics. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is go ahead and start with a round of introductions. We're going to have Larry and Apoteem introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with you, AP, um, as you go by also initials as well as me, MPH. And what I'd like you to do is go ahead and give us a little bit more of a long form of your backgrounds. And, you know, for the people who are listening to the recording or here today um, in our community, um, uh, what I also wanted you to do is explore what made you interested in this topic. We've had a bit of a discussion in preparation for today, but would really like to um, you know, have you, you share a little bit of what made you say yes to the opportunity to have this conversation. So um, AP, if you wouldn't mind starting us off and then we'll go over to you, Larry. Thank you, MPH. Um, good evening, good morning uh, from wherever you're watching this. Um, my name is Apratim Kurakayashta, uh, also known as AP. Uh, currently, I'm the Chief Product and Technology Officer of a company called Skillsoft. We are in the ed tech space. Um, we are into e-learning. Uh, in this company, I've been here for about six plus years, and I have um, designed um, a few things in this company, take them to market, such as a learning platform, and also changing the way we manufacture content and so on and so forth, right? So it's been quite an exciting journey. You know, in the middle of the journey, we took this company public uh, from a privately owned situation. So that was another uh, kind of an interesting moment in my life, a unique moment in my life. Um, before Skillsoft, um, I was um, actually playing a dominantly business role. Here, I also play kind of a business come technology role because as a chief product officer, there's a massive business hat I have to play. Um, 
in the in in a company I used to work in a company called ACI Worldwide, which is in in financial uh, payments tech technology company. There, I actually transitioned from a technology role from into a you know in a president business role. So I've seen kind of both sides of the world in in that company. And before that, for the longest time, I was in IBM. Uh, I started my career in IBM Research after um, graduating from Duke University, and then from IBM Research, I went on to build. IBM's one of the early SaaS products called Lotus Live. It you know um, it was all sorts of collaboration offerings in the cloud. This was 2007 and eight, uh, very early days of SaaS. People would say, "What is SaaS? It, does it have one A or two A's? That kind of stuff, right?" So I go quite a bit back in in this in this domain. Um, the question was, what makes me interested in this topic, right? Um, I think this topic is. Um, what I would call foundational to, to any discussion about technology, right? Personally, I'm very customer centric um, and a collection of customers, uh, large enough collection of customers forms a market. So you may call me market centric as well. Um, any sustained technology investment has to be justified by value, value to a set of customers or a market. And so that's what makes me interested in this topic, my fundamental nature being very customer and market centric. Over to you, MPH. All right, thank you so much. I love that and the idea of value. And in this, you know, as we, as, we, as we go deeper into this topic, I'm thinking about all the different ways that we can apply these learnings because we can know the value, but how is it that we communicate it and how do we unpack that value? So a lot of lessons in them um, of trial and error, I'm sure, in your background and looking forward to digging into that as well. Mr. Larry, we'd love to have you do your intro and then and then share a little bit about why you said yes to explore this topic today. Thanks, Marilyn. And, you know, after almost 40 years, I, I have not joined the MPH bandwagon quite yet. Oh, OK, so, uh, I'll, uh, I'll always be you. I'll try. I'll try. Um, yeah. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Larry Donovan. I am a I am a forty year career um, software guy. Is the way I describe my experience. Um, I've done pretty much anything you can do centered around developing software and almost exclusively in uh, human capital management. Um, I. And my background is a little unique as I spent the middle 20 years of my career in uh, product management and engineering, um, leading software development teams, uh, built a, an HR platform, a global HR platform from scratch uh, in the 2000s. Um, and then I spent uh, five years of my career in a go-to-market leadership role at Ceridian, where I led sales, implementation, customer success, and support uh, during the early years of the launch of the Dayforce product, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and then I uh, aspired to uh, be a CEO, and so I've had the good fortune to be a CEO twice, first uh, for a company called Mineral, uh, which supports um, uh, HR compliance, primarily for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, and then I spent three and a half years uh, as the CEO at Namely, uh, an HR software platform uh, targeted at small and medium businesses, uh, which we sold to Stonepoint Capital uh, almost a year ago, be a year next month. Um, uh, since then, I have continued to be uh, working closely with uh, investors. Um, I help do a lot of work with investors around due diligence and um, contemplation of investments in technology products. Uh, and then I serve on a couple of boards as well as my work uh, as the principal at the Cephalo Group, um, where I focus my attention on uh, working closely with investors and with uh, CEO, software company CEOs. Um, and, and one of the reasons this topic was the most interesting to me is because at its core, um, I, my, I, am, I am deeply passionate around the alignment um, between, you know, the operation of the business, its strategy, and its values. And one of the things I found over and over again is there's too much championing of software initiatives or technology projects um, that get that get um, created, inspired, and often even built in isolation uh, without a full understanding across those dimensions. Uh, and so one of the things I've tried to do as a leader is first and foremost, help organizations understand how do we talk about the business? Who's the ideal customer profile? How do we talk about our values and the vocabulary that we use to do that? And then how can, as a leadership team, we continue to hold ourselves accountable to staying in alignment with those things? 
you know, uh, the, the example about generative AI was a fascinating one because I've been working with uh, a company around that issue specifically. And, 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 and you outlined it perfectly when you talked about differentiation versus efficiency. But most importantly, the real question is, uh, you know, how are we going to make big bets or small bets uh, on technology projects that at every dimension are aligned around that strategy and value framework? Um, and I have found that if you can articulate that well, that's the job of the CEO. And if you reinforce it, hundreds, maybe thousands of times, even for people like us that are sitting in the boardroom, um, then and only then do you get that kind of penetration that that not only produces great outcomes, but kills all the projects that wouldn't. Uh, and so helping helping leaders understand that and challenging to think provocatively about it is something I'm very passionate about. No, very well said. No, on, um, on our next question, I think that you've You've kind of laid the groundwork on that. So permission to go off script <laughs> with you um, and go a little deeper. And um, so I think I think what you just did here, Larry, is you you laid out at a higher level the role of the CEO. But you didn't always know all of that, right? I mean, it's like you're not like appointed as a CEO and then know exactly what to do at every time. Maybe could you share just a little bit about how you the the process that you went through in in really internalizing that playbook or the, the set of concepts that you use and maybe a little bit of the trial and error that you experienced in yeah sure figuring that sure. out yeah. I'll, I'll give you a great example um you know when i first joined namely in uh 2019 that that had come as a result of some consulting work i had been doing with the, with the then ceo of the company around product strategy and it was all about product strategy um, but, you know, the first question I asked was, well, who is the ideal customer profile? And what I learned was that it was anybody that would buy. I mean, within reasonable boundaries. In this case, you know, anywhere from 50 to 1,000 employees. Unfortunately, if you know anything about that space in particular, um, you know, 50 to 1,000 employees easily encapsulates two, perhaps three categories of, of software products. So what was what was so missing from, from my perspective there as I joined the CEO is that that the, the leadership team did not have a playbook of sorts for how to think about the business, right? Everything is always about asking the right prioritization decisions. And if the CEO doesn't draw the box and then, and of course has to take on, you know, effectively full responsibility ultimately for making the call on what that box is going to look like. Um, you know, it's it's all it's almost impossibly difficult um, for everyone to rally around that really effectively. Uh, and so, for me, the for what I had to do, and 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 this is this creates interesting challenges for CEOs if they come into the job with domain expertise versus they don't. If they're founders, if they're not, etc. Um, but certainly for me, the question was. You know what? What? What right does this business have to exist going forward? That's unique. That's differentiated. That can serve customers very, very well. And lastly, um, you know, achieve the objectives that our investors um, have signed up for um, with the folks that have, uh, you know, their limited partners in most cases that have invested the money. And so um, that was the first, you know, I spent the first several months trying to figure that out and then try to articulate it. And that has many dimensions. It's about what happens with the roadmap. It, it, it affects how you make investments. It also ultimately affects what's the final outcome, you know, um, especially with most of the technology companies we encounter today, there's always a desired outcome, whether it's the investor who has been in the deal for a number of years wanting to move on. Um, and pass that torch to another investor or an IPO um, or a sale to someone else. Or in the case of, you know, founder-led businesses, maybe, you know, it's a lifestyle opportunity for which they want to run the business, you know, in perpetuity. None of that is achieved without that framework being well-defined, well well-articulated. And of course, it has to morph over time. Um, but it can't, it can't just change liber liter liberally. Um, and a lot of CEOs make that mistake because they don't sign up and then commit. Um, and then they allow either others in the business to kind of diverge from that, or they, uh, they've they never articulated it themselves. So everyone's floundering. 90% um, of the time, that, that's what I see um, as the biggest obstacle to try to try to deal with the symptomatic aspects of this that we're talking about. 
And so it's always very fascinating in that regard because companies are always in different places in, in, amongst these issues. You know, you said something that was really powerful um, that gets into the alignment question was how to draw the box, how to draw the box with your team. And so when you're thinking about the strategic alignment and you've got your leadership team, what goes into drawing the, the box with your people? Well, certainly it's a collaborative effort. You know, you have to step back from it. Um, but it's something that the CEO has to facilitate. And it, and it, and it first and foremost, it, it, it answers the critical question of who's the ideal customer. Because every one of us go into these markets, you know, and especially if you talk to investors, everyone wants to talk about addressable market. How big is it? 80 billion, 5 billion, you know, 2 million. Um, and everyone exaggerates it like crazy in every dimension. But at the end of the day, unless you understand who that target customer is, and then can convince yourself and your board and your investors that there's a big enough market to serve that target customer well and grow and do it profitably, um, you know, you can't you can't lock it in and then run with it. Um, and frankly, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. And a lot of people make mistakes at it and have to rethink it and and or or they're not committed to it long enough. And then they could just they're constantly changing it. When CEOs do that, all, all chaos reigns. Mm -hmm. So so how to do it well and what what not good might look like as well if you're if you're in that scenario. So it's a pivotal role. And so thank you for for going a little bit deeper on that as well. So if we if we maybe pivot the thought process here a little bit specific for CTOs. Um, and let's think think about like emerging CTOs. How do emerging CTOs improve their tech strategy communication with other stakeholders? So there's the up, you know, communicating value up and across and down um, and outside, but maybe AP, if you wouldn't mind taking a stab here at this, this topic. It's something that I'm sure you've given a lot of thought to given your what you shared with us of your background. No, no, th thank you, Meryl, for the question. I actually uh, have to go back to what Larry said and relate my answer to what he said, because some of the things that he said is actually extremely insightful. The first insight being actually thinking that you're communicating a tech strategy, right? in isolation. Um, to be honest, that is um, one of the biggest mistakes an emerging CTO could make is try to communicate a technology strategy in isolation of the business strategy. When you are a C-level exec, like a CTO, for example, right? There needs to be an inherent understanding of what the business strategy is. For the next couple to three years, let's say, what are the big problems are we trying to solve? relating to Vikas's chart, strategic priority one, two, three, four, five, right? In an all hands communication, those things seem like, okay, fine. Those are strategic priorities, you know, kind of high level words, but they're actually pretty serious, right? In terms of how, what is the business strategy that our company is executing today, right? How it's factorized into different priorities, one, two, three, four, five. An inherent understanding of the business strategy is important to communicate any technology strategy that complements or supports that business strategy. So an inherent understanding of the business context and strategy is step number one, right? Without that, you are in a wrong direction from the very beginning, right? Um, but that's not enough. An inherent understanding of the business strategy is not enough because you're, what you're trying to do is asking for investment or positioning the work, trying to fulfill that business strategy with the power of technology, right? So I think that, you know, what I have seen useful again for an emerging CTO is, first of all, getting an alignment in the room that, to the virtual room, <laughs> that, hey, here is the business strategy and priorities, right? Given where we are today, so there's always where we are and where we wanna go. That picture is very helpful, right? Where we are, where we are and where we wanna go what are the technology bridges that are required from where we are to where we want to go? And maybe there are three to four components of those bridges. So what you're trying to do is creating a blueprint of the house 
keeping in mind the architectural vision of the house, not in software architecture, but business architecture vision of the house. And you're trying to show the blueprint of the house one by one, this plus that plus that gives us the realization of that strategic priority, right? That level of clarity of expression, which I call high level outline of the solution has to be presented that is crystal clear, right? To satisfy strategic priority, let's say two and three, this is a high level outline of a technology solution that I'm proposing, right? Then one question a CTO should always ask and explicitly ask, right? Because the answer may not be clear, which is the age old question of build by partner, right? As a CTO, the answer should not always be that we build everything. It could be that we build nothing, we partner and uh, just integrate, right? It could be that we you know, partner with a part of it and build a part of it. So what is the combination of build by partner in your technology strategy, right? Because the answer is not always uh, either route to market or speed of development or cost or practicality. The answer is not always build everything. So a CTO, not only be has to relate what to the why, the why is the business business priority, what is the outline of the solution, but how, what are the best approaches, right? At a pretty high level, build by partner. And then the last but not the least is, you know, what is the relative outcome that you are expecting out of this, right? In terms of a three-year investment horizon and a three-year growth or return horizon, right? It doesn't have to be a finance thesis, right? It doesn't have to be something that, you know, that will be audited by EY or PWC, but it has to be believable and credible in terms of investment versus projected return in common terms, such as net new business acquisition or, you know, upgrades and growth from the customer base, right? As a CTO, some basic economic terms has to be linked to the solution. So I think you complete the story. Why am I proposing this? Linked to the strategic priorities. What exactly am I proposing? Components of the solution. How do I want to get to the solution? Choice number A, B, C. Okay, so I'm going to make choice number B. And this is why. And if you go through choice number B, this is the quote unquote, the overused word ROI. I don't want to quite use that word, but the net business effect, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the recipe, I would say, within Larry's framework, right? I think his framework is valuable, very similar to what Vikas showed also. That's a recipe for an emerging CTO. So how do you actually tell the story progressively, right? But at a high enough level, consumable pretty quickly, you know, within, 15 minutes or so. Hey, question for you here, AP. And we're we're in a safe space here. Yeah. But and maybe you've been one of the lucky ones where you kind of came up in your career and everything all worked perfectly and you never had stumbles along the way. <laughs> I I've made, I I've made a lot of mistakes personally. But I did wish. you have any did you have any particularly poignant experiences where you got it wrong and then had a shoulder shake or did did you kind of did you evolve into this without incident no 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 in in you know i'll, I'll tell you um small things uh, i have gotten wrong almost every year right right so i'll give you I'll, I'll tell you a couple of small things and then move on to bigger things right like and why the bigger things were wrong right um so the small things getting wrong, you know, as a, as a chief product or technology officer is essentially what comes before what or after what in a, in a roadmap that you're designing, the sequence of your investments, right? Mm -hmm. And I get 20% of it wrong every year, every year, right? And after that, I reflect saying I should have done this first and not done that first, right? But that's an abstract example, but I think many people like me will relate to that. When you're making a sequence decision or a prioritization decision within a box of investment, right? You get the prioritization wrong 20, 25%. Um, that I get wrong every year. 
every year, right? And I learn from it, and maybe the percentage improves by a couple of percentage points, right? Um, I'll, I'll give an example of um, a significant thing that I think I got wrong in, in my career overall, right? So I'll go back to my, my days in IBM, right? Um, building a world-class cloud SaaS collaboration product, simply because IBM at that time was a leader in collaboration, right? Lotus was a big name in collaboration, right? Um, millions and millions of dollars of revenue, thousands and thousands of customers, right? What I underestimated was that the framework that um, Vikas showed, right? The product market fit was kind of there, right? You know, the corporate collaboration was a big market, right? Um, everybody was talking about cloud, 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 right? Um, SaaS, 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 cloud, cloud, cloud. Didn't take much convincing to actually get some initial investment into that, right? Because the senior executives bought into that, right? But taking a product to market and becoming successful is far more complicated than building the right product, right? What I, the lesson I learned there is conditioning of the channel. The channel being, let's say, the sales force, right? Because taking, for example, a subscription product to a market through a sales force that is conditioned to selling big deals into big organizations, through a different sales model, right? Which is, uh, you know, term license model, right? It's very difficult to recondition the sales force, right? It's very difficult to articulate um, the value in a very different manner, right? Mm -hmm. That day I learned that the job of a technologist and a, and, a, and a product person does not end with building the product only. You have to think through the whole life cycle of how the product actually reaches the customer. Who is going to actually explain the value proposition of the product to the customer? How is that person incented and why? You have to think all the way through. Otherwise, your product may be technically quite superior or even you know, quite superior in many, many ways. But if you get the channel wrong and the model wrong or both wrong, you're in trouble, even if you have good product market fit. So that is a lesson I learned through that experience, right? That you might have a very good product. You might have something that's first or second in the market. You might not might, might have something that is unique. Uh, at that time, a combination of email, word processing, collaboration, web conferencing in 2007, all packaged in one box was actually quite unique in the market. This was the days before Google Apps was Google Apps, right, in the cloud. But again, the model and the channel yep. was something that I missed, right, or did not pay enough attention to. And it could have been much more successful than it was. Well, that was really... Um, very insightful. And I will just tell you this, I was a lover of Lotus Notes and there has been nothing else that has replaced it. <laughs> so even with the Google suite, so I still miss, uh, I, I still miss some of the workflow elements that were included in that. So we're going to have to geek out on that at another time. Um, <laughs> Larry, you, you know, you've been, you've been in all these roles, right? And so it, it's, it's all these different hats probably come on over time and place. But if we go into the CTO hat that you've played in the past as well, and think about the emerging CTO, you know, any any thoughts or punctuation that you'd like to add on the idea of the tech strategy communication and alignment with the stakeholders? I mean, I, I think I'm gonna jump on AP's analogy and he talked about a recipe for how to do that, which makes sense. So now that you have the recipe, how do you actually bake it? And I will tell you that the, the most important thing that I've done in my career while I was a CTO um, was selling. And it was at every dimension. It was being able to articulate and sell the vision and its alignment with strategy, to my point earlier, to my peers. It was my ability to deeply understand 
um, how our salespeople were going to sell it to our customers. And that requires CTOs to have sat across the table from the prospect, not just ask the top salesperson what they think, because that's often distorted. Um, and, 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 and AP alluded to it perfectly. When you talk about when you build something, um, how do you launch it? You know, while, while there's lots of support in marketing and sales um, for launching a product, at the end of the day, it is, it is the, the, the CTO's job to make sure it happens. Um, and if you have the right support across those teams that continues, to my point earlier, to align with strategy, you've at least built a road on which you can travel. Um, and, you know, and then execution, uh, you know, as P appropriate, appropriately noted, um, you know, comes into play. Um, but, but, you know, my, my number one uh, success, my, my number one, the number one activity that I performed that was the most effective in my career as a CTO beyond just, you know, being able to effectively manage a team and get stuff done um, was the fact that I was deeply embedded um, with our sales and marketing teams all day, every day, so that it never got to that place where I just presented something that I built that everybody looked at and was like, well, why the hell did you build this? Um, and, and, it, and, and you add to that alignment with the CEO around the customer we're chasing and keeping everyone aligned. Um, and then you got a formula for success. And you also won't burn a ton of resources along the way with you know, kind of getting off track, which often happens. Uh, because everybody gangs up on on whoever when we get off track to say we're not on track anymore. You know, we have an understanding, we have a vocabulary for how to talk about it. And we've all signed up to hold each other accountable to making sure we stay on that road. Um, because there's no pavement on those on those sides of the road that we 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 veer off of. And um, and I found that to be wildly wildly effective. And then as a CEO, um, being able to to work with the teams, whether it's marketing, sales, engineering, and the like. Um, to, to, to keep people on the same page. Very well said. Thank you guys. This is, that's fantastic. Um, well, why don't we, uh, why don't we dive a little bit deeper into AP, your background, you're, you're doing some writing here. You've been inspired to get your ideas into, uh, into tax, which is really an important step. Um, but could you, Share a little bit. You're, you've been writing about product market fit in the enterprise context. And I think for anyone who is uh, with us here today in our community, there should be some links in the chat. So if you want to check out uh, AP's writing, um, it is there. But if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about this and giving us some background and you know additional context, AP, I'd love to hear it from you. Yeah, I'm, I'll just keep it relatively high level and simple. I'll start from one of the success elements that Vikas pointed out, which is uh, product market fit in the whole value chain, right? So if you focus on that box for a second, and, and this, this article is about that particular box, right? Um, for the success of a product, it is a given that product market fit is critical, right? You build products for a market. Otherwise, why would you build for a product? Now, in this article, I draw a distinction between product market fit for a mass market product, like let's say a consumer product or a large SMB product, right? Um, versus an enterprise product. What happens in a consumer product is obviously you need product market fit, but your product evolution and the requirements are based on not any individual, right? Because an individual consumer or a small team will have only limited effect on your overall revenue, right? So you actually, your product market fit is based on secular demand patterns, right? More broad market level demand patterns, right? So you can actually build the product to some extent as those secular demand patterns change or you, or you, or you see opportunities in, in secular demand, right? That's one way that I see product market fit gets navigated in, in a broad consumer or large SMB sense, right? For an enterprise, it's actually quite difficult or different, I, I would say. And it comes from the root of what is an enterprise. You know, an enterprise by definition is successful because it's differentiated, right? Suppose one of your customers is an enterprise, right? 
An enterprise by its very nature is successful because one of the things is it's differentiated. It differentiated not only in the products that it sells, it differentiated in the culture that it has, it differentiated, it, it is differentiated in the internal infrastructure that it has and the practices that it has inside the company. Typically a product uh, needs to map to an enterprise's culture, practices, internal infrastructure, what they will do and won't do, et cetera, right? So then how do you build a product that is a product, which means a reusable asset to unique receptacles, right? Think of an every enterprise being different and differently shaped amoeba, right? With different uh, integration requirements, with a different culture, different processes that won't change, right? And your product is like a nice oval and you're trying to place an oval onto an amoeba, right? So there is never a 100% product market fit. So then how do you build a product for an enterprise where actually you're trying to put an oval on top of an amoeba or many amoebas, right? How, that's the picture that, that you should think of. And product market fit is um, difficult for enterprises without certain elements built into the product, right? So, you know, a product has many, uh, uh, many attributes like reliability, scalability, et cetera, et cetera. People think of that all the time. But I think uh, enterprise product, one of the most important attributes without giving up its soul is malleability, right? In the old days before APIs, people would actually do custom branches for enterprises. Obviously, that's not sustainable. I'm not advising that. But malleability is actually very important for an enterprise product. What is malleability? Configure a portion in, configure a portion out, right? Have an, a very rich API layer for integration and extensions, right? So these are not related to feature function. These are related to how you embed a product into a docking station, which is the enterprise. And the docking station is not standardized, right? So that is what product market fit is in the enterprise context. So it's a very different way of thinking. Malleability is the only single word uh, description that I can, I can provide. But all these things that I just said is actually kind of building up to mal the malleability concept. So that's what I write about in this. Yeah. Love it, love it. I. Uh... I'm going to make this required reading for all of our clients. <laughs> so um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this well, is, uh, this um, is brilliant, uh, AP. I mean, the whole idea of a fit sort of uh, evokes the image of, you know, fixed shapes that fit into each other. But here you have, by definition, um, something different every time for each enterprise. In fact, there's a question here in chat that... Uh, kind of takes this a step further. It says, can you discuss the possibilities of autonomously con producing or configuring a product instantaneously from real-time data for each individual or business? In other words, could this product behave differently for different businesses uh, based on the data that may be available? Yeah, within limit, right, obviously. <laughs> Sorry, is this uh, like the flexibility? Maybe this is the wrong word. I don't know, but like the idea of um, mass customization, if you would, and the ability, you know, the flexibility that comes along with that. Yeah, um, and that goes back into the design of of things. So, um, yeah, no, this is is we. I think we 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 could have a whole session just on that one topic. So, really, really a good one. All right, um, I'm looking at our time here and. Uh, uh, we've got uh, one last prepared question, if you would, and then we have the ability to have a little bit more of a discussion depending upon how we are coming up on the hour. But we've we've said a little bit about frameworks and vocabulary here in this discussion. And we'll just lob this out here. Um, does having a common strategic vocabulary foster better alignment? And can you share some examples, maybe some specific examples? And uh, maybe Larry, if you wouldn't mind on this one, given yeah, us I mean, start. Sure. 
I think I think vocabulary is one of the most powerful uh, aspects of how leaders make a difference in thinking about uh, um, strategy. I'll, I'll go to the top level. You think about traditional mission, vision, and values, and all of those. Like you know, and I've done it. You know, every, virtually every CEO will will attempt to articulate those. And then usually, what happens? Two things happen. It gets thrown away and never read again, or you get CEOs running around the hallway. This happened to me once a long time ago, where the CEO was like, I'm going to walk up to you and challenge you and tell me if you can articulate our, our, our mission. And I'm like, please, this is ridiculous. What it really, what really happens, and it's also true with respect to strategic frameworks, is that if you if you have articulated them effectively, they will generate their own vocabulary, right? It, it has to be organic. You know, what often happens is you get a bunch of buzzwords get created, but they lack substance. But if you've established a framework, you've connected it to mission, vision, and especially values, then vocabulary will, will present itself. So I'll, I'll give you a really good example. Um, a classic scenario, you've got the, the top performing salesperson, the rainmaker, making, making it happen. Um, and that person is screaming about everything. They're screaming about their sales development person. They're screaming about product. You know, uh, you, you can hear everything. Um, and and while while they have a great insight into what's happening and can be a great source of information about the business, you know, you get into this classic uh, challenge of the the what and the how of performance. So they might sell like crazy, but they leave you know dead bodies in their wake. Um, and and the the vocabulary we use, and a phrase I always like to use is this is this is this is behavior that is inappropriate or or it lacks alignment with our values. And when you say that to someone, or your your perspective on this is out of alignment with our strategic framework, you know, it forces everyone to kind of look and say, well, why is that? Because of course, there's a lot of technology folks that are carrying some torch for some great idea that they're supercharged about. And it could be a great idea, but, but because of its, because it doesn't connect to the, the, the framework at all, let's just say, and then no one has any shared vocabulary to try to highlight why that's the case, often it will get all kinds of momentum, a bunch of resources will get burned. And all of a sudden we're talking about the fact that we did something and there's no customer for it, or it's an AP's point, it's not going to help revenue, it's not going to improve, churn, reduce churn, it's not going to increase retention, um, and, and you end up throwing it in the trash. So it is, it is the vocabulary combined with the courage of the leadership team fostered through trust, uh, uh, using that alignment to really create uh, a dynamic kind of communication that not only advances the good stuff forward, but also make sure the the stuff that isn't that great, you know, gets challenged, and hopefully, um, you know, resources don't get wasted on it. There's so much wisdom in there. I'm just thinking on the home front, your behavior lacks alignment with the strategic framework of this household. <laughs> yeah, I probably wouldn't do it <laughs> that way, but <laughs> yes, actually, there is a version of that. There is a version of that, but slightly changed. So this is no. your takeaway for also not only at work, but also at home. AP, no. you've got some well, lessons on this or insights. Yeah. And in, and in my house, as you know, I'm married to a therapist. So imagine how that goes down. <laughs> right. This is, this is, oh boy. <laughs> we you are lucky. You, you, our next you are lucky. <laughs> um, no, I will, you know, Larry said a lot of brilliant things there. Um, I'm just going to keep it simple, right? I think um, one or two important words, uh, actually three important words that I try to insert in almost every technology discussion, every product discussion, every investment discussion is what problem are you solving? What customer problem are you solving? Or to make it simple, what is the customer use case or cases, right? Um, if there's an understanding up and down the organization that we, are, we solve business problems with our software, 
And the business problems we are solving can be encapsulated in easy to understand use cases, not like, you know, a paragraph, but easy to understand use cases. Uh, that's an unifying uh, thread I find in many discussions. So if, if we can actually unify everything we do around what problem are we solving and what are the key customer use cases that this investment is supposed to solve, things become easier. So I think customer use cases is actually a very important three words in my vocabulary that I use in, in the organizations that I lead. I love it. And it, and it aligns exactly, Larry, with the point that you were making on whatever 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 code where you use for ICP use cases, we're all kind of talking about the same, same things, but at the heart of it, what are the problems that we solve? So, and with that, we are, we are approaching the top of our hour here on, and I think we've completed our prepared questions. Back to you, Shikant and uh, Vikas. Thanks, thanks, Madeline, uh, and thanks, Vikas, for for conducting that you know uh, insightful discussion with uh, AP and Larry. And as we all learned, I think uh, you know. Uh, when technology leaders are seeking budgets uh, and roadmap priority and decisions and consensus, it's very important that uh, they communicate in, in strategy terms that other people understand and what are important to them. So it's not only just talking and using technology jargon or what the industry is doing, but connecting with the business that is important. And there, of course, uh, you know, the whole strategy frameworks um, can come to your aid. And like Larry and Apratim alluded with their personal examples and what they prioritize in their communications, developing that common vocabulary and using that uh, with your stakeholders uh, makes it uh, much more effective and collaborative for you to uh, realize your common business goals. And of course, for the CTOs to become individually uh, very successful as they as they move forward. So, I think uh, great uh, discussion and you know uh, quite interesting thoughts. Uh, before we dive into the questions, uh, Madeline, you want to talk a little bit about uh, WorkTech Advisory? Give us a little bit about WorkTech. Yeah, you thank do? you. And again, it's it's been an honor to be part of this conversation today and to be part of this overall series. And um, Work Tech Advisory, we are a global consultancy that specializes in working with solution providers, uh, servicing the HR tech. And the, as we are expanding that, that uh, if you would, the areas that we touch and that we are involved with in terms of solving problems in business, but in the work tech sector. And what we do is re we really help our clients unlock the full value of the investment that they've made. And the, the heart of the, the work that we do, easier said than done, is the what are the problems that we are solving? For whom? You know, why? <laughs> and um, uh, how are you strategically positioning yourself in the, in the ecosystem? And for how much? So again, it's an honor to... Uh, be part of this discussion and um, and uh, uh, yeah, just uh, um, looking forward to also the future conversations that we're going to be having on topics that are uh, that we experience together with our clients um, across the spectrum of making all of these parts work across the board. Thanks, thanks, Milo. Um A quick overview about Harbinger. Um, Harbinger's uh, vision is to transform the way people work and learn. Um, what we do is we provide uh, product engineering services and content engineering services to software vendors and enterprises. Um, the, the main areas that we specialize in are HR, e-learning, digital publishing, education, and uh, working closely with the with the high tech industry. Uh, to learn more about us, you can visit our website and uh, or jump into a conversation with any one of us. So, uh, but 
bringing this discussion to all of you um, and, uh, you know, having AP and Larry part of it, in addition to Vikas and Marilyn hosting it, uh, was a truly enriching experience. And uh, uh, we hope to, like Marilyn said, have more such discussions uh, on related topics uh, as we extend this roundtable series uh, over, over this year. So moving on to our final thoughts, questions. Any, I know we are at the top of the hour, but um, so since we are at the top of the hour, Marilyn, I think the best thing for us would be to kind of get the list of questions and then respond and put it in the uh, in the final rollout of the webinar. So yeah, just as as a follow up, we've got a, a couple of them that have been floating around, and so. Um, but just to keep you uh, keep you primed is if you would, um, what happens when we have the CTO and the CFOs having different priorities and how to resolve the framework? Um, that is uh, that is one that has come up. And uh, let's see if we have any others, Shakant. But there's one. Help. I mean, Gen AI is a pretty interesting topic. So, yeah. so I think CTOs are lo always looking for answers as to how to convince um, how much we should go ahead and invest on that. So those are a few things that we would love to provide answers to. But Every single one of our clients has been dealing with that very topic. And also the buyer community is dealing with that right now. Everyone is in the question on how to figure it out. So um, so we have some homework assignments a little bit, um, uh, AP and Larry, if that's all right. And then we'll... Uh, We'll That's perfectly that. all right. And I think we can okay. definitely okay. answer some of these offline, collect and edit, and then send it out. Brilliant. And then also the recording as well. Thank you. Yeah, because any final thoughts? No, I, I was just thinking the questions are giving us uh, new ideas for the future roundtables in the series. And uh, it's been wonderful having you, Larry and uh, AP, sharing your thoughts. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, right. everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.